So Audio Technica has just released their entry level open back studio reference headphones, the Audio Technica R30X. And today we're going to look at whether or not that's as exciting as it sounds. So if you're unaware, Audio Technica announced a couple months ago that they were going to release three new headphones as part of the expansion of their reference lineup of headphones. The first was the Audio Technica R70XA to replace the original R70X, and the second was the R50X as a new addition to the lineup. And lastly, they rounded it out with the R30X a couple months after. The R70XA comes in at $350, the R50X at $200, and the R30X at $100. I recently did a video review of the R70XA and the R50X, and you can find it on this channel, so watch that if you want a bit more context on these headphones or just more information about them, because this review is gonna be focused on the R30X. When it comes to build quality, holding it in my hands, the R30X, definitely you can tell they had a few cost-saving measures with this one. It just feels cheaper and more plasticky overall, even though there is a mix of metal on the headband and metal on the sliders here, just the cups just feel more plasticky than its more premium older brothers. It's not a bad plastic, it still feels sturdy, but it's just the type of headphone that, you know, if you told me you found it at the back of a sound booth in a drawer and it's been sitting here for 10 years, I wouldn't question you. The other real key cost saving measure that they had of this one is that it has non-detachable cables. And you can bet as soon as I learned that, I immediately complained to the Audio Technica rep. The answer they gave me was that to get it to $100 at the margins that Audio Technica needed to make this profitable, non-detachable cables was a necessary compromise, which fine in a world where prices keep going up and up and up. If that's what it takes to make a $100 open back headphone, I can live with that. Now, speaking of the cable, the other thing to note is that it is a three meter long uh, studio style cable. So, you know, it's not the fancy type of cable. You might want to tie it up a little bit if you're planning to use it at your desk. Now, the other thing that you should know about this headphone is that it uses 40 millimeter drivers instead of the 45 millimeter drivers found on the original r x the r XA, and the R50X. In other words, this is a completely different driver, which you might expect to have different sonic characteristics and sound quality, though once again, you know, it's not all about the driver, it's about its implementation, but I'm just throwing it out there, okay? When it comes to fit and comfort, the R30X is thankfully quite good here. Despite using a similar suspension strap system as the r XA, it's a lot more comfortable because of a different type of headband here. And so when I put it on my head, the first thing I notice is that it's a bit of a smaller headphone, so I do have to adjust it to be a little larger with the sliders here. The second thing is that there's no gap at the base of my ear, which is great. That was a really big problem that I had with the Sony X8. And the other thing is that it holds my head snugly. It's a good amount of clamp forces and it's not too tight, but it doesn't feel loose as well. Now, as far as the pads go, it is about similar in size in terms of diameter. So the bottom of my ears do touch the base of the pads. But once again, I didn't really have that as an issue for me. You know, your mileage might vary if that's something you really hate. I'm not a fan of the fabric that they use here. Maybe it's for tuning, but it just, once again, feels kind of cheap. It's a bit rougher, less plush, less soft, less premium feeling. But these are minor nitpicks. It's fine. I can wear it on my head for hours at a time when I'm at my desk. And it's also quite light at 210 grams, just like its older brothers. But before we get to the sound, I just want to give a quick shout out to headphones.com for helping me with the resources to make this video. If you didn't know, headphones.com is not just a place where you can buy headphones, but also a place where you can learn all about them before you buy them. In fact, most of my reviews can be found as written articles on their website, along with a ton of other really in-depth resources on nerdy stuff from the rest of the team. So once again, thanks to headphones.com for allowing me to indulge in this hobby. My first impression of the R30X is that it's a cross between the R70XA and the R50X. Like its siblings, it has a lifted tonality in the upper mids and treble. It's kind of the opposite of that Sennheiser Veil, which for the record, I don't really agree with, but you know, it's just an easy way to get my point across. Anyway, this lift is largely still relatively within the realm of being balanced. It's not quite neutral, but it's balanced. It's definitely not as bright as the R50X, which is a relief, but does lean towards the bright side like the R70XA. I like it. The vocals are clear and effortless, and there's no sense of straining or harshness here. Listening to it for longer though, I started to notice where this headphone can kind of struggle to keep up. Basically, the R30X is a headphone that needs to be played on the louder side. If I'm just casually listening to music quietly, it's okay, but the bass and roll-off is particularly noticeable, and instruments other than the vocals can be a little bit lost. Of course, generally speaking, if you turn up the volume, things are probably going to sound better, especially because of the Fletcher Munson curves, which tell us that our ears more easily perceive bass and treble at higher volumes. I just find that it tends to be particularly effective on the R30X. 
When I'm listening to this on a comfortable quiet, the bass on this headphone is weak. On my head, pretty much anything under 60 hertz or so is a whimper. It just doesn't provide the necessary depth for those final octaves. However, the R30X does have a fair amount of energy in the mid bass, it, so it still brings the bass punch that drives music. Bass guitars still have their body and richness. The easiest way for me to describe this is with an example. I have a test track called Losing It All by Anne Berlin that I like to use for this sort of thing. In the opening bar, the first beat starts with the floor toms and the final fourth beat ends with a single note of the kick. You can actually hear quite a bit of the toms at the start since it's at around 120 hertz or so, so it's not super big or boomy but it's there and it's clearly audible. But with that final fourth note of the kick, you can only really hear the attack of the beater head. You can barely hear the rumble and depth of the actual resonance in the drum itself since a lot of the energy comes below the 80 hertz region. So you do lose out on that added dimensionality of music because of the bass roll off. However, if you turn up the volume to a comfortable loud, which for me is around 80 decibels or so, it does bring back a lot of what was missing. I went from a, yeah, okay, whatever, to, okay, here we go, here, this, this is good. I went from wanting to complain to asking myself, is it really worth complaining about? Now, don't get me wrong, the bass roll off is absolutely still there. It's just a lot less wimpy if you give it a little more juice. As for the bass quality itself, it can feel a little poofy, like it's more about moving air rather than giving detail and texture to the notes. Its bigger brothers did have this sort of feeling as well, but it's not quite to this extent. Overall though, I think there's sufficient definition here that I'm not going to nitpick too hard. The mid-range of the R30X is pretty nice. There's plenty of clarity in the vocals, it's forward without having any sense of it being nasally or shouty for me. Male and female vocals are equally well balanced and neither is preferred. Now, if you are used to something that's a little bit more recessed or relaxed in the vocals like the HD600, the R30X can be a bit hot at the peak of some notes. There's also a bit of bite in the sibilance, though nothing too egregious. I think the first time I listened to this headphone, it was the balance in the vocals that made me feel at home with its tuning. But like I mentioned, if you aren't listening to it on the louder side, the rest of the instruments can start to get a bit lost in moderate to busy tracks. Outside of the vocals, I find it hard to isolate individual instruments and follow their melodies. Normally, I just listen when I'm working and let the lead lines kind of come to me. But with the R30X, I sometimes have to kind of look and hunt for them. Turning up the volume helps with this issue a little, but it's still a bit paradoxical that the R30X has the seemingly clear and lifted mid-range, yet it doesn't highlight the typical mid-focus instruments quite as well as I'd expect. I'm a bit mixed with the treble of the R30X. I'd consider it elevated, but well within reason and it's definitely not as bright as the R50X, so it's gonna be a lot more manageable for most people. There's good crispness and air and sparkle without being exaggerated or feeling like it's imbalanced. From a broad view, the treble of the R30X is serviceable. Good, even when compared to some headphones where they have really big treble peaks that can be painful. But it's when you listen to this headphone a bit more closely over some time that you realize its treble control is a little bit loose. I mentioned previously that there is some minor sibilance in the vocals, and that's an example where the third R30X has a few small peaks here and there. And for me, that's really the challenge with this headphone's treble. Hats and cymbals generally sound good for the most part, but sometimes the notes can be a bit harsh or splashy when I don't expect it. It's not painful, it's not overly sharp, it's just a little bit off in the timbre. The other issue that I have with the treble is that, like the mids, notes can start to lose focus. I'll listen to a passage in the treble and it can be a bit hard for me to make out what exactly is going on despite there seeming to be good definition with the transients. The good news is that even when I do turn up the volume, treble doesn't become that much brighter or sharper. The improvement in the low end far outstrips any sort of negative effects you might have in the treble. The bad news is that unlike the bass, it doesn't really fix any of the treble's issues. It's louder but it's not really any cleaner. Now as far as perceived technical ability goes, like its older brothers, the imaging and staging of this headphone is pretty good. While like a lot of headphones, it is still very much in your head, it does feel more open and less constrained or narrow feeling than compared to something like the HD600. If a song requires that the notes be kind of like out here, the R30X can do it. Really, it's the resolution that's the weak point of this headphone. It's, been, it's what I've been talking about where, you know, I feel like instruments start to lose focus when a track is even moderately busy. Bass impact isn't great either, but uh, you know, that's to be expected with something like this. Honestly though, audiophile nitpicks aside, 
the fact is that this is a $100 open back headphone. I think some small part of me was hoping that this would be a slam dunk and I can put some sort of clickbaity title and be like, this is insane. But instead you get a, yeah, this is pretty good. I, I'd buy it. You might have noticed that throughout this entire video so far, I haven't shown any measurements. And that's because I don't have them. I recorded everything except for this section without having seen the graph once. I don't even have the R30X anymore because I shipped it out for those measurements. So here's a moment of truth. To be honest, this is not what I expected. According to the graph, the R30X has a bit of a V-shaped profile with a healthy amount of bass and an elevated treble with a big peak around 11 kilohertz. But I didn't really hear that. Yes, the R30X is on the brighter side, but I didn't find it peaky. It's also definitely much lighter in the bass than what I'm seeing here. I was expecting more of a roll off than this. For reference, here's the R30X versus the HD600. You can see how much more bass the R30X has, but personally, I was experiencing a similar bass curve to the HD600, with maybe even a bit of an earlier roll off. Which is why I kept talking about the need to turn up the volume to get the bass quantity that I wanted. Now, it is possible this is because I wear glasses, so I got a measurement with glasses on. And okay, that 2 to 3 decibel reduction in the bass looks a bit more like what I was expecting, which makes sense. As for the mid-range, this was more aligned to what I was hearing. It's nicely controlled up until the 3 to 4 kilohertz mark where it injects just a bit of energy for vocal presence and clarity and that overall sort of lift that I was talking about. So how do we explain this difference between the graph and my subjective experience? The answer is called HPTF variation. This is just a fancy way of saying that different headphones will sound different on different heads. And that might be an obvious statement to you, but this is actually a very complicated and technical topic. And if you want to learn more, you can watch this video by Resolve called The Truth About Sound Quality. All that to say, this is yet another example of why you really have to try a headphone on your head to see if you like it or not. My subjective experience will necessarily be different from yours because of our different head shapes and anatomies. And I suspect the R30X will have quite a bit of head-to-head -head variation on top of that. The good news, however, is that at least from a graph perspective, I would say that the R30X is fairly reasonable, especially for a $100 open back headphone. All right, now back to the pre-record a bit. Before we conclude, I do want to talk about your other options. Specifically, there is one primary competitor to the R30X, and that is the HiFiMan HE400 SC. That's a headphone you can find for about $60 on sale if you're brave enough to go through AliExpress. The tuning of the HE400 SE isn't quite as good as the R30X's, but I do think that it does have a bit of an edge in terms of that perceived technical ability compared to the R30X in terms of the resolution and layering, that sort of thing. That being said, however, I would still recommend the R30X over the HE400 SE. The simple fact that the R30X likely won't have as much quality complaint issues and more importantly, it won't have that major treble peak on the HE400 SE that can be a deal breaker. As for the R50X, I would recommend that you get this headphone instead if you have the money and can handle the added brightness. Or really, any of the popular options like the FIO FT1 Pro or the Sennheiser HD 6XX. These headphones definitely feel more hi-fi for music than the R30X does. Because the thing is, with the R30X, it's a solid headphone at $100, but I'm not sure I would pay much more than that. 120 maybe at most, but definitely not 150. The strengths of the R30X lie in the fact that it's at a very competitive price and that it doesn't have any real major deal breakers, which sometimes that's all I'm looking for. Anyway, that wraps it up for this review of the R30X. And to answer the question, I know that someone's gonna ask, yes, you should buy the R30X for gaming. No, I won't elaborate. That's a topic for a completely different time. Have a great day, everybody, and consider subscribing if you haven't already, or join us over at the headphones.com Discord if you have any questions.